Could we get Marcel up here and then maybe the two speakers could be at the table and we could address questions to either or both? Do you have a question for Dr. Farah here? Either one. My question has to do with the field of music therapy since many tests have been made proving imaging, functional imaging, proving, at least according to some of the standards of reliability and validity, that various areas of the brain are affected by music and music therapy can be used therapeutically to reduce pain. And I would like to know, not, not just emotional pain, actually physical pain, and I would like to know if either of the speakers have investigated any of that kind of imaging and that kind of use well, I'm, I'm, I'm not very expert on this, and Marcel may have more to say, but um, there has been a fair amount of work done on uh, the way the brain processes music using, using imaging, um, and some you know, very interesting findings, including um, people who are really trained musicians um, and you know, listen to music in a way that only you know, a, a real expert can um, process, you know, process it in different parts of, of the brain. Um, and uh, I don't know, many years ago, there was a kind of um, speech therapy, melodic intonation therapy that um, was supposed to help aphasics, you know, relearn to talk. The idea being that it would, um, you know, engage it would, it would sort of bypass the damaged language areas and, and engage the musical circuits and You have questions that you'd like to ask each other? After you. <laughs> I, I think the questions from the audience are much more interesting. I think we should go back to the All audience. All right, let's go back to the audience. Elaine? Uh, I am using the microphone. <laughs> yes. Right, so uh, now I'm afraid you're switching from imaging 101 to imaging uh, 999. Uh, these are uh, fundamental questions. Uh, uh, the functional MR is based on blood flow. So when a neuron works, it needs more blood. But uh, there could be a little neuron working here and the blood flow could be much broader than the area of neural activity. That's one problem. Second problem is that between the time the neuron starts to act and the blood gets delivered, there is a lag of two to six seconds. That's another problem. The third problem is that functional MR is totally insensitive to baseline. So all you're doing is you're subtracting one state from another state or one time from another time and seeing what the changes are. So if you see two or three or five spots, that means that within that subtraction or that analysis, those five spots are more active than the others. It doesn't mean that all the other areas are not also active. It's just that the change is not as big. So all these things are things you have to keep in mind in interpreting any experiment. This is why it is really so difficult to come up with simple answers from a functional imaging experiment. Are, are all of these subtraction methods all programmed the same way, so that they happen the same in Cincinnati as they do in Los Angeles? Uh, of course not. Uh, it, in fact, the latest issue of NeuroImage was devoted to exactly the same data set that was sent to five laboratories, and they came with different answers. That's the, that's the question is reliability then. The, the, well, it's the statistics are exceedingly complicated. We're talking about things that uh, occupy full time, uh, really top notch statisticians, and they have different approaches uh, to the statistical issue. This is not uh, a lack of reliability or poor quality control, but this is truly at the heart of the difficulty of the statistical method. Yes. Uh, is there anything in the uh, 
functional energy and literature that indicates uh, a difference in uh, uh, problem solving uh, with uh, gender between like a spatial and uh, uh, logical uh, language problem solving? I think I'm going to have to read up on that because everybody's asking me at that these days. Um, you know, there's this new book, The Female Brain, that's out, Luann Brizantine. Um, and uh, I, I haven't actually read the book, but what people tell me about it, it, it you know, it sounds like gender differences are, are made to sound, um, you know, enormous. Like there's kind of two totally different kinds of brains, the male brain and the female brain. And um, that's clearly not the case. Um, but there, there are some, you know, on average, there are some differences in brain function between males and females. Um, whether, whether that difference is, you know, bigger than the difference between two randomly selected males or two randomly selected females um, is another question. And, and, and yeah, and I'll just end my answer there. <laughs> Well, I mean, at least one big difference is in relation to sniffing male sweat and female urine. Um, but uh, the other difference that's well known for years, for centuries, is that female brains are less heavy by about 100 grams. And it just goes to show you that intelligence and brain weight are just simply not related to each other. But this is a very consistent finding. Female brains are smaller, but that's also related to body size because brain size is correlated with body size. But uh, uh, beyond that, um, uh, really the hypothalamus and you know this area that responded to uh, the pheromones is in animals as well as the one part where structurally differences have been shown in the dendrites of neurons in females versus males. So this is something that is known as a sexually dimorphic part of the brain. It varies from gender to gender. But other than that, I agree with Martha that a lot of these differences that have been published, uh, male versus female, uh, in the end turn out to be reflecting inter-individual differences and not necessarily gender differences. Yes, over here in the aisle. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm in a line of work that uh, requires a lot of people take polygraphs, and we basically concern those polygraphs to be witchcraft. Um, the employees that uh, perform the uh, polygraphs are mid to lower level employees. So when I hear you talking about interpretation by HR in the future, what is the skill level that we're expecting these HR specialists that would be utilizing this? I mean. I don't see us investing a lot of money in people that are going to be the cream of the crop that are doing that, just like it's not the cream of the crop that performs the polygraphs today that lets um, a Mr. Ames or a Hansen or some of the other spies get through, especially when the people are already living a lie. So I'm, I'm very fascinated by that. If you could just address that, how you see that in the future when you make reference to the HR folks? Well, I mean, in some sense, because I think these methods, you know, even in, even in the hands of the world's greatest imagers uh, are not reliable. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's almost a moot point. But then again, following up on a question from this side of the room, you know, there's, there is a company called No Lie MRI. Is that the one that you were talking about? Yeah. That, you know, is supposedly getting ready to offer these scans to people for various purposes, um, uh, and um, yeah, and I, I don't know, do you, do you know what kind of person is going to do the interpretation? Ken, do you have a comment on that? No, I don't know who's going to be doing it. I mean, I don't think they've made that clear. Other questions? But the individual, and the gentleman is quite right, the, the individual skill of the polygrapher is acknowledged by even most polygraphers to be the essential ingredient in making lie detection work, um, usually because the polygraph exam is more a situation in which information can be extracted about other matters and 
the actual interpretation of the chart is almost the least relevant part of it. It's more uh, interrogation with this machine sitting between you. And so it's a good interrogator that's really called for. We have a question Has here. Has anybody done a controlled experiment on that? Give the interpreter a fake polygraph? Yes. Uh, okay. Come to the microphone. I just thought I had to get involved. Um, as far as the polygraph test, it's really more up to the minister, whoever's administering the polygraph test on the questions, whether or not the questions are given, you know, so they can answer true and then false. That's how they'll find out whether or not the polygraph is working. It's very easy to manipulate the system, as the gentleman stated. You know, he would not reveal. But as far as that coming up to HR or whatnot, I don't, I don't see it happening. Because it's not even admissible in court for that reason. For the reason that is that as far as polygraph tests, uh, again, very easy to manipulate. So just trying to answer. Thank you for your comment. It may not be admissible in court, but it's enough to keep an individual from getting a government job. That is that's true. But again, if, if to manipulate, if someone doesn't know how to do it, they can't. And, you know, who to say, you know, it's going to work? I mean, it works most of the time. Let's come to well. Let's come to this young woman's question here. Unless you forgot. <laughs> no, no. Um, when the Penn study came out about lie detection, the first thing that I read about it was I think in Scientific American, and it said neuroscience ready to find terrorists, or I mean something really extreme, which was really disturbing to me because it. I mean, it was a good study, but it was one study, and it just doesn't seem ready. Um, so, do you know if the legal community or Congress or anybody is having conversations about freedom of thought and privacy and what's going to happen with all these studies and new technology? Well, yeah, I can I can tell you that you know, like the ACLU held a conference um, last summer, I think, in, in New York about this. Um, there is an organization called the Center for Cognitive Liberty and Ethics. That's out of California, and um, you know, just the the name of it, and I don't know, you know, I, I assumed that they were like wackos, um, but um, you know, like, and in fact, you know, there, I mean, it's it's a not uncommon, you know, schizophrenic, you know, delusion, fear, you know, that the government is spying on your thoughts or you know whatever. So, um, but actually, I think the CCLE is actually a, a pretty good outfit, and uh, you know, they are writing, you know, legal briefs on some of these issues. And so if you're interested, uh, I, would, I would direct you to their website. CognitiveLiberty.org, right? Yes. Oh, okay. You know it. Okay. <laughs> In the back. I have a question that goes to the ethics issue. Um, so, fMRI can tell us about the neurobiology of decision making, how people may cho make choices. Um, and I'm an economist, and I really want to understand why people choose to consume today versus save later, and things like this. And fMRI can tell us what the mechanism is behind these kinds of choices. In the hands of the right people, policymakers, you know, social scientists, this is wonderful information, this is good knowledge. In the hands of the, right, of the wrong people, like marketers, this is terrible, okay? I mean, I could, I could be influenced to buy a car tomorrow if the marketer knows how to trigger my nucleus accumbens, okay? So as a consumer, can I prevent this? Can I prevent um, being manipulated by individuals who know what the brain mechanisms are behind choice? Uh, you know, if I may just, uh, you know, your brain uh, is uh, much too intelligent to be fooled by any such um, uh, device. In fact, the whole issue of subliminal advertisement and so on has been around for decades, and we don't see people who are being convinced to do things they don't want to do with subliminal voices in theaters and so on. 
I think the fear is uh, just simply not realistic. I, I think the brain is a wonderful device that has its own uh, security um, uh, 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 software already installed in it. And unless you really take somebody, you open a hole and you stick an electrode and you kind of stimulate the right part, I, am, uh, I really doubt that you will be made to buy the car you don't want to buy. Uh, yes. <clears throat> In your presentation, you touched on the differences um, between some children who had had the effects of possible neglect during their early ch uh, childhood years. How long will it be before we could definitively diagnose things like fetal alcohol syndrome, bipolar, depression, ADHD by looking at the brain and prepare a treatment plan based on that diagnosis? He's the real doctor, so. Um, as I said, functional imaging is not a diagnostic device. Uh, yeah. Functional imaging is not a diagnostic device. Um, but there are many other imaging uh, modalities from EEG to SPEC to PET and so on and so forth. And all they tell us is that this brain uh, it deviates from normal. Um, but there are other ways of diagnosing fetal alcohol syndrome and so on. So it's not something that depends on imaging. In many instances, that's a clinical diagnosis, and um, uh, then the question becomes, is the brain different? That's a research question, and imaging could address that. That's the answer being used for that purpose right now. Yes, I'm sure that it will be used because in medicine, uh, one level of decision-making, is this normal or not? And so these imaging modalities allow you to do that. Is the size of such and such a part of the brain normal? Is a, a metabolism normal? Um, that, but then again, to answer the deeper question of why does the fetal alcohol syndrome have these particular results in these children, behaviorally, emotionally, cognitively, um, that's, uh, not yet uh, what functional imaging is up to. Last question over here. Has imaging shed any interesting light on sleep research? We talked quite a bit about what's going on when people are awake, but what about when they're asleep? Uh, you know, that's a recent area of tremendous growth, and uh, there is work on sleep. It is as yet a little difficult to interpret but uh, some of the findings um, are really spectacular, especially uh, there is, believe it or not, uh, sleep research on fruit flies in Drosophila. And uh, some of the findings are, I think, the most spectacular things that has occurred on sleep research because one of the theories is that the purpose of sleep is actually to do house cleaning in your brain. So during the day, there are all these things that happen, some useful, but many totally useless. And one of the purpose of sleep is to get rid of things that are useless, so that you can not only consolidate the important things that you experience during the day, but also be ready for learning new things. If there is anybody who has a burning desire to ask questions, please come up to see the speakers. If not, I want to thank the two speakers for excellent presentations.